I'm going to start with a raise of hands because why not? It's fun. How many people here have used the new Netflix downloads feature? That's a nice show of hands. All right, no, keep your hands up, please. All right, so of those of you who have used the feature, how many of you have experienced a downloads limitation error? Ah, good. All right, hands down, thank you. So the reason I'm asking that is today we're going to talk about the service that backs the download feature that validates whether you can actually download content based on the new business restrictions that came with downloads. So who am I? My name's Philippa Avery. I'm a senior software engineer at Netflix. I was the project tech lead, tech lead and one of the engineers on the downloads license accounting project. This is my colleague, Robert Ritter. He was the event sourcing system architect on the event sourcing project. So to start with, let's go back in time, back to November 2016. This is a lovely picture of us sitting in the war room on the day that Downloads was released. There's Robert, there's myself, sitting in the front row, waiting nervously as within minutes of this photo, all around the world, press releases were gonna go out to say, Netflix customers, you can now download content onto your device. Awesome, scary. The reason why it's scary is here's us watching to see our license validation service come online and take traffic for the first time ever. So the way Netflix wanted to release this service, the feature, was that they wanted customers to experience the ability to download everywhere globally at once. For us, that meant no rollout testing, no global testing, not even friends and family testing. Everyone experienced it at the same time that our service was about to take traffic for the first time ever. No pressure. So what I'm going to talk about today is why we needed this new download service. Let's talk about the problem statement. Secondly, we're going to give a bit of an event sourcing overview for those of you who are new to event sourcing before deep diving into how we implemented the architecture of our event sourcing system. Finally, we're going to come back out of this and talk about what it was like as an engineer after release of this service to continuously work on it and iterate on the business requirements. So to start with, I'm going to give you an overview of what the streaming playback lifecycle is. I'm going to do this so that we can then compare it to the downloads and you can see how the requirements are different. So when you press play on your device and you go to stream some content, the first thing you're going to get is a playback um, context. This gives you the metadata for your playback. It gives you the URLs that you need for streaming. It gives you information such as the language that you're going to be using. After you've got that, you can go and get the license. The license allows you to decrypt the encrypted content on the flyer and buff it up. Then as you play, we're going to generate session events that get sent up to our server. These tell us how the playback experience is going for you. Then when you press stop, we get a couple of events telling us that the license has been closed and that you've now closed the session. So how does this compare to downloads? It's pretty similar to start with. You press download, again, we generate that playback context with that metadata. Then we also generate a license, but now the license is slightly different. In the downloads case, that license can be persisted on the device and used over and over again. In streaming, it gets used once and then it's gone. Now you can use it over and over again. And then you can actually download the entire encrypted content and store it on the device. Once you have these, you can now start the life cycle and that life cycle can now last a year. So you can have content on your device and it can stay on your device for a year. You can press play repeatedly. Every time you press play, we're gen gonna generate session events again. And then the next time you come online, we're gonna send them up to the server so we can still see how your playback experience is like. And then at some point in the future, about 30 days after that initial download, that license you got is going to expire. You can then potentially renew that license, which means the expiration is extended for another 30 days or so. The ability to renew that is actually dependent on some of the business requirements I'm going to talk about in a second. Then lastly, when you're finished with the content and you delete it off your device, we get a signal telling us that you've released the license, it's no longer being used, and you can potentially free up another slot to download more content. All right, so now that we've talked about what the life cycle is and how the differences are between the downloads and, and streaming, we have different business requirements which are there for the downloads um, life cycle. 
we have different business requirements that are Netflix requirements as well as studio requirements. So let's go through some of these. One of the requirements we have is that you're only allowed to have a certain number of devices at any point in time with downloads on them. This means we need to keep track of what devices a customer currently has and what downloads are on that device. Secondly, you're only potentially allowed to have a certain number of downloads per studio category. And that number can change depending on the studio um, negotiations. Thirdly, and this one's interesting, over the course of a year, you might only be able to download or watch a certain piece of content twice in the year. So we need to keep track over that year of what content you've watched, how many times you've watched it, and if there's any restrictions in place, potentially have a validation error that occurs on the third time. So we now have this life cycle of a year which we need to keep track of the customer's state for a year. With the streaming example, we didn't have to keep track of the customer's history. We're a stateless service. All the information we needed to process the request was given to us in the request. Now we need to actually have this state recorded. We need a new stateful service, the license accounting service. So let's talk about some of the requirements that we needed from this service. First and foremost for us was flexibility. Those business requirements I just mentioned, when we first started designing this project, we had no idea what they were gonna be. They were still under negotiation. So all we knew was we needed to design something for use cases that were coming and it needed to be flexible to account for them. Additionally, even after release, we still had further business requirements that were gonna come out. So this needed to be an iterative, flexible design. Secondly, it needs to be debuggable. So as I said, we could have a year's worth of data. We could have a customer come in and said, I just got a validation error that said I can't download this because I've hit my download limit for something that happened three months in the past. We need to be able to look back three months and say at that point in time, what happened that caused this error and the customer is saying it's incorrect. Where's the bug in our system that's been counted by that three months ago issue? Third, needs to be reliable. We're a tier one service. If we go down, Netflix goes down. Let's not do that. So how can we make this reliable and fault tolerant so that we're not going to bring down the service? Fourth, goes without saying, we're Netflix. We need to be scalable. We needed to scale from that very first day to potentially tens of millions of users around the world. So how do we account for that? So let's deep dive into each of these. Flexibility, how can we make our service and our domain model flexible? So when we first looked at this, we, we definitely looked into relational database models. We have um, experience on the team with using relational databases, but we wanted to actually abstract away from the database so we didn't have to directly interact with the database to provide this flexibility. We didn't want to have to have the migration tools and we didn't want to have to add new columns, et cetera, to bring in new um, changes to the domain model for the new business requirements. What we wanted to do was have all of those changes possible in the application layer, in our, in our case, the Java application layer. So one way of doing this was to use the document model. In the document model, using versioning on the object itself, we could then serialize the object, store it to the database, bring it back, make changes as needed, create new objects as needed, and we get our flexibility, right? Perfect. What are we losing? Debugability. Every time you make those changes, you're mutating the data and you've lost the history of why that mutation occurred. You've lost the state change. Event sourcing gives us that. It gives us an immutable transactional history of every single state change that has happened over the history of the customer. You can then take those events and you can replay them and you can form your domain model at the current state. And if you version the events, and you version the domain model, you can make it flexible. You can add new fields for ongoing events. You can create new events which are gonna affect the current domain model. Robert's gonna talk about that later, so don't worry, we will dive into that. So we've got the debugability, reliability. We achieved these through fallbacks, which are default customer behavior in the case of outage. I'm gonna deep dive on this in a bit as well. And finally, scalability, how did we achieve that? <laughs> 
So our service was achieved scalability through the use of a um, tooling we call Scryer, which is predictive scaling, and I will dive into that a little bit later. And then inherently through the use of event sourcing. So I'm going to hand over to Robert now, who's going to talk about how we apply this as well as what it is. All right, so before I deep dive into event sourcing, what I want to do is give a general overview of the pattern for those of you who aren't familiar with it. So if you think about the way we traditionally work with the database, we'll send our query out to a data store, and we'll get back some values. What we'll do is we'll wrap those values into a domain model, and we'll use that for the rest of our processing. Now, what this domain model represents is the current state of your object at that moment in time you did your query. As Pippa said, what we don't have are the events that got us to this finalized state. That's just as important in some situations. So in comes event sourcing. I have a little visual aid here to help me out to explain it in a high level. What you're actually seeing on the screen here is some frosting in different colors. Look at the leftmost color, and it's this cream color. This is the initial state of the frosting. This is how it gets delivered to the bakery and, you know, cream is great and all, but we want to have some fun with it. So we want to add some food dyes to make it red, blue, whatever the customer wants. So in my example, we can think of the domain model being a simple frosting object. And it has one property, as the color. And the goal of the baker is to change that property to the color that is dictated by the order. So in this example, she has an order, calls for a purple cake. So we need to make this into a purple frosting. So she has a system that she works with. She goes up to it and she has two inputs that she puts into it. One being the initial state of what she's working with. Here we have the cream frosting. The second being a command that dictates what do we want this frosting to be after it's been processed. So we feed those two inputs to our command handler, which in this example is the system. And the command handler knows how to change the state of this domain model. Um, so given the make purple command, it's smart enough to know that in order to move from this initial state of cream, to purple, we need to do two things. And it's going to shoot out two events. First, you're going to add red. Then you're going to add blue. These events are then given to the event handler. In our example, the event handler is simply the baker, because she's the one that's going to be applying the events to our domain model. She takes the first event, adds it to our current domain model, and it's red. Now, this wasn't what we wanted to be. We wanted to make purple. But we still have one more event left. So we're going to apply that on top of it. And that gets us to purple. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to change some terminology on you. I'm no longer going to say domain model. I'm going to start using the term aggregate. Now, an aggregate is a domain model. The difference between the two is that you can decompose an aggregate to the events that got you to this finalized state. So in this example, this purple frosting here can be decomposed to two events, the add red and the add blue events. And if you always start with the same initial state, this cream color, and apply those two events on top of it, you will always get to this purple frosting aggregate. Now, going back to the commands, command is a part of the nomenclature you'll see when you start researching event sourcing. And it's a little unfortunate it's called a command because a command kind of implies that you have the authority to move from one state to another. But that's not the case. In event sourcing, a command is really more of a wish. I wish to get to this desired state. Here in this example, you'll see that the two inputs are my current state, which is purple frosting, and I input a make red command. Command handler knows, well, the only way I can really make red out of purple is by extracting the blue. And we know a baker doesn't have the ability to extract colors, only to add colors. So the command handler is going to deny this request. So even though you give it a command, you need to be able to still fail safely. And this is a good example of uh, um, where the state doesn't change and no new events are created. Now I'm going to pull out a little bit. Here's a uh, high-level overview of the components you would see in a typical event sourcing application. What I want to focus on in the beginning are the two pairs in the middle, the aggregate service and the aggregate repository. Now, these always come in pairs. For every aggregate that you support in your system, you're going to have a service in a repository. So an N aggregates mean N pairs of these. Also notice that for every component, it's directly dependent on the one that's to the right of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to start with the event store, and then we're going to work our way left to kind of give a better overview of how all of these play together and what their individual roles are in uh, event sourcing. So let's start with the event store. This is your database. The implementation is up to you. You can be whatever you want. just depends on what your business requirements are. Do you prefer scalability? Do you prefer consistency? There's just a lot of factors you have to weigh until you eventually get to the implementation that you're going to run with. But at the end of the day, 
the event store is basically just going to take a row ID and send you back a list of events. And these events are what you're going to replay on top of an aggregate to move its state incrementally until you get to that last finalized state. One thing I do want to note is all events on a single row do not necessarily apply to just one aggregate. You can have the events apply to multiple aggregates. And we do that by assigning it an aggregate ID. So for every distinct aggregate ID you have in your list of events, there's going to be that many aggregates. And here's an example of two aggregate IDs. Aggregate ID 1 being the blue color, and aggregate ID 2 being the pink color. When we process these, this is going to result into two aggregates for us to process with. Now, something has to query the event store to get this data. That's where the repository comes in. The repository takes queries in your domain jargon and translates it to the appropriate statement to send out to your event store. So whether it's SQL or CQL, it's going to go ahead and just translate it and say, hey, give me all the events that I'm asking for. So in this example, the repository is asking for all the events in our highlighted row. The event store is happy to oblige and will return the events we just zoomed in on. This will give the repository the events in memory, and it's going to start bucketizing them by their aggregate ID. So as I mentioned before, this actually maps to two aggregates. So the repository is going to start placing them into their buckets. We start with E1, which has an aggregate ID of 1. E2 has the same aggregate ID, so we're going to place it in that bucket. Now E3 has its own a different aggregate ID, so we create a new bucket and we place it there. Now we have no more distinct aggregate IDs, so we're just going to let the repository finish up bucketizing these events. Once they're placed in their appropriate buckets, we create two uninitialized aggregates, and we're going to start applying these events on top of it. And for every event that we play on top of it, it moves the state forward in time until we uh, exhausted all our events and we get to the finalized state of our aggregates. Aggregate repository also has the ability to update the state of an aggregate. And it does that by accepting two inputs, your current aggregate and the command you wish to apply to it. Command handler knows in order to get to our desired state, we need to apply these events to it. So in this generic example, the command handler gave us two events. It says, in order to fulfill your command, just run these on top of your current state. Repository will add those events to our aggregate that's in memory. And now our in-memory aggregate is updated. So anybody who has a reference to this now has the new values. It will also send the events out to the data store. So here we're telling the event store to append these two events to the row ID that we had queried earlier. So now when we zoom in on it, you'll see that E8 and E9 are now at the end of this list. So when we go back and we query for this row ID, we're going to get that new state that we changed to because of the command. And finally, we have the aggregate service. This is the uh, public-facing API that your customers are going to work with. So when you package your library and you ship it out to them, this is going to be the layer they're going to interact with. The aggregate service is business aware. It knows what your business rules are. So it can reject the request of your customers trying to do something they shouldn't be doing. Um, in our example, subscription plans or the number of times you can download a certain title. Similar like the repository where a repository can reject a request because of an invalid state change, service has the same capability, but for a different reason, just more business validation. In this example, we asked the repository for all the aggregates for a specific customer, and the repository responded with two aggregates. At this point, the service can just think of them as domain models because it doesn't necessarily care about the events that got it there. So it's going to look at the size of the list that came back, it's going to look at the values of the aggregates, and it's going to make business decisions based off that. All right, so now I'm going to talk about two aggregates that we actually use in our system today. We have a license aggregate, and we have a downloaded aggregate. License aggregate, we create those anytime we hand your device a license. We need to keep track of it. As Pippa said before, we used to just hand out licenses and forget about it. But now we want to know exactly how many do you have at any time? Because that's important for our business validation. So we'll create the license aggregate. When your device is done downloading, it will notify us with an event. When we get that event, we'll create a downloaded aggregate, and we'll save that off. This allows us to be able to reject a request if a specific title has been downloaded too many times. All right, so walking through the example here, when you hit download on your device, it's going to need a license in order to play that media. 
So it's going to hit our acquire license endpoint. And it's going to forward that request to our license service. It's going to ask the license service for a license, and if it's successful, it's going to return, it's going to respond back with a license to get to the device. In this example, we have our customer being Bailey, and she wants to download Glow, season one, episode one. Now the license service, as I said before, is business aware, and it knows there's only so many times you can download this title. But what it's actually going to do, it's going to defer that um, to the downloaded service. It's going to ask the downloaded service, is Bailey allowed to download this title again? Downloaded service takes it from there, asks the repository. For this customer and title combination, give me all the aggregates that exist in our event store. And only do it for the past year, because our limits are yearly based. Download repository goes, does its thing, returns back two downloaded aggregates. Each aggregate represents a time that Bailey downloaded this specific title. So we see that she downloaded it February 15th, and she also downloaded it May 25th. The downloaded service is now going to do the business um, validation. It knows that the yearly limit is three for this title, and it's going to look at the size of the list that came back, which is two. So now we're going to respond back true to our license service. We're going to tell the license service, you have to go ahead to give her a license. She has one more slot left available. License service is then going to create an uninitialized license aggregate because a new license means a new license aggregate. And it's going to also hand the license repository a command to get it to an initialized state. And the command is going to create, it's going to have some properties of what we want to apply on top of the aggregate. Repository takes the two inputs, passes it on to the command handler. Command handler knows what events need to happen in order to get it to this initialized state. In this case, it creates a license created event. And it has a customer ID set with the title that she downloaded and when she downloaded it. This event is then handed to the event handler along with our uninitialized aggregate. Event handler is going to replay it on top of the aggregate. And now we have an initialized aggregate. It tells us the customer ID, the title, when it expires, we typically have a 30-day window of um, how long you're able to use the license. So here we have July 27th, that's the expiration date, and whether or not it's released. Basically, did you delete it off your device, which means it's no longer active. It's false because we're about to send this to you and you're gonna use it as soon as you get it. And then finally, the license repository will save this event to the event store. So the next time we want to update this license aggregate, we will ask the event store for all the events that's associated with it. In this case, there's only one. So now we know that we would have a license aggregate that is still active when we um, query for it. And then finally, the license repository tells the license service that the aggregate was created successfully. The license service then goes out to our DRM servers, gets a license, and then passes that back to the device. So the device has its license. We have, uh, we're keeping track of it. Now, quickly, going back to the is allowed question, we could have done this with just the license aggregate. We didn't need to have a downloaded aggregate. In order to do that, the license service would ask the license repository, give me all the licenses that Bailey has had in the past year. And with whatever I get back, I'm gonna filter out the, uh, the licenses that have to do with titles that I'm not interested in right now. So as you can imagine, the vast majority of these licenses are gonna be filtered out and then whatever I have left, I'm going to use that as my size, and I'm going to compare it to my yearly limits. Now, this is a very expensive operation. Think about what this implies. You have to read every event that Bailey has ever done within the last year, map them to a license aggregate, send them to the service, and the service is going to probably just discard about 90 to 95% of them just to get to this final answer. So what we did was we created this downloaded aggregate to quickly answer this new query we needed to support. So for anybody who's familiar with denormalization, this should be very familiar to you because it's pretty much the same thing. If we have a new query that you need to support, look at your aggregates. Can you support it? And if you can, can you do it efficiently? If not, go ahead, create a new aggregate just to support that query. It's okay. We've done that before and it works great. All right, so now I'm going to deep dive into our, our event store implementation. We ended up going with Cassandra. Give a quick overview on Cassandra. You have three different types of columns in Cassandra. First being the partition key. The hash of these values is going to tell you which node in your cluster your data is going to live on. Next comes the clustering columns, because many rows can map to the same partition key. We want to be able to group them by a value. So we're going to group them by the first clustering column. And then within that grouping, we're going to group it by the second clustering column. 
and so on and so on. Just depends how many clustering columns you have. And then finally, we have plain old columns. You can't search against this data, but it's the data you're trying to get to uh, when you finally locate the row and you read it in. So this is a schema of what we're using today for our event sourcing table. Row ID, it's up to the license aggregate to create a row ID. Each aggregate, I'm sorry, each aggregate can independently um, choose how the rows are gonna be stored in the, uh, the event store. Typically, the row ID is simply the customer ID appended with the aggregate name. Now, because it's that simple, you can imagine lots of rows are going to map to this row ID. So we want our first clustering column to be the aggregate ID. We want to collate, co-locate all the events with the same aggregate ID together. And then within that grouping, we want to sort it by the event time. This is going to put our events in a natural sequence that when we get it back in our query, we're going to play it in the order we got it on top of our aggregate. And then finally, we have the event data, which just has our serialized data, and an event mapper, which will tell us what serializer to use to uh, deserialize the data. I want to talk about Cryo. This is the uh, serialization framework we ended up using in our uh, system. It's open source. You grab it in the GitHub URL that's down here. Um, what we loved about it is out of the box, it has a number of serializers that will probably be good enough for your requirements. For us, we had a requirement that we needed to version our events because as Pippa noted, requirements change and we need to be able to change with it um, easily. So we wanted to stamp our events with versions. So that way, when we read in a version number, we know what values to expect in the serialized data. If it's not there, we're gonna have to provide a default value. All right, so here's a visual representation of an example of events in our data store. So here we have two customers who've downloaded three titles. Uh, if we focus on Matt here, he uh, downloaded House of Cards and Buddy Thunderstruck. There's no like um, values, so the aggregate ID ordering doesn't uh, take place here. Now let's say a little bit in time, we move forward. Matt's done with House of Cards, so he deletes it off his phone. That's going to give us an event to tell us the license is no longer active, and we're going to create an event called Release License Event. Now, notice it slid right under the first row. Reasoning for that is because it shares the same aggregate ID with the first row, which is House of Cards. And we've told Cassandra we want to group these together. Once that grouping has been created, we are then going to sort it by the event time. So since RC3 is greater than zero, it slides right under that first row. What this gives us the ability to do is to search Cassandra for a specific aggregate. And we do that by providing a row ID and the aggregate ID. In this example, we're going to get two events back they're going to be in the order we need to play them on top of our uninitialized events, our aggregate, I'm sorry. And it's going to uh, finalize into a license aggregate that's been released. We also have the ability to ask Cassandra, give me all the aggregates for this customer. And we do that by simply providing the row ID. Now we have two distinct aggregate IDs. So when a repository um, processes this, it's going to return back two aggregates. One with House of Cards, which shows that it's been released. One with Buddy Thunderstruck will show that it's still being used. Now, at a certain point in time, there's, you're going to create so many events that you just can't process them all. It just doesn't make sense to process every event that has happened since the beginning of your service. So this is where snapshotting comes in. What you're going to do is the aggregate is going to set some conditions that say, if any of these conditions are triggered, create a snapshot of where we are. And then from then on, on we're going to refer to the snapshot and move forward. The triggers can be anything from how long it took to process all the events or the number of events that it did process. Either way, we're going to take the materialized aggregates and we're going to serialize that and save it off to our database. And we're going to save it off to our snapshot table. Every aggregate starts off with no rows in the snapshot table. So we have a default version of zero. The row ID, once again, the aggregate is going to, is responsible for defining its own snapshotting strategy. So it's going to create its own row ID. The version number, as I said, if it's not there, it's zero. Otherwise, we want up the number. And the snapshot data. This is going to be your list of aggregates that is serialized. Going back to our example, let's say Matt triggers a snapshot. So we ended up taking the aggregates that we created, and we save it off to the snapshot table. We start with version number one, since there wasn't one before. We can get to it easy by the row ID, just Matt and the aggregate name. 
And the event data, once again, is a list of the aggregates in serialized form. So the next time Matt makes a request, we're going to look at the snapshot table first and get the most recent version. Here, it's version one. We'll read it in the binary data and we'll create the list of aggregates. Then we'll go to our event table and we'll say, we only want the events that happened after this snapshot. And the way we do that is by appending the snapshot version at the end of our row ID. So all the events that happened before our snapshot happened with the mat license aggregate and zero at the end. Once the snapshot happened, we start saving our events with a one at the end of the row ID. So we'll take this single event and we'll apply it to the appropriate aggregate that we serialized and we'll move on from there. So that's a general overview of event sourcing. I'm gonna take it back to Pippa and she's gonna describe what it's like to actually work with the system. Yeah. Good luck. Thanks. <laughs> Apparently, it doesn't want me to talk to you people, I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, so everyone knows designing a new system, implementing a new system, it's fun, you get to play with things. But then you get to have to work with this new system. So what's it like after we release this? How has it been like working on and iterating on the license accounting service? So I'm gonna go back and reevaluate those four key points that I went through before and talk about how it's been in practice. So what was flexibility like in practice? Robert mentioned Cryo, we mentioned how we can version the events and the aggregates and we can, re can create new fields. We do this on a regular basis where all we have to do is go into the actual Java object, add a new field to the object and create an annotated version on that. It's really easy and I'm not gonna go into that because of the simplicity. Instead, what I'm gonna do is deep dive into something that's a little bit more interesting. I'm gonna talk about a new business requirement that we had recently, which required us to create a whole new domain model, a whole new aggregate. So this requirement was that you could now go onto the website, select manage download devices, and you can remotely deactivate one of your devices. This means if you lose your device or you wanna free up a slot, you can go online and basically release all the licenses and have the, that content removed from a device. However, we only want you to do this a certain number of times a year. So we need to maintain state now and record how many deactivate devices happened over the course of a year. Whole new flow, whole new domain model. So let's talk about the components which are required to do this. Let's step through them. First thing is we're gonna need a new endpoint for the service to actually um, serve the request on. We're gonna need a new device service that as Robert said, has our business requirements layer. This is where we say, are you allowed to deactivate the device or any other potential device um, functionality? Thirdly, the device repository, which will interact with the device aggregate and create the device aggregate for us. And finally, we're gonna need, for this case scenario, a new device, a new deactivate device command and device deactivated event. So these are the new components that we needed for this workflow. How do they work together? We have the flow where the endpoint will actually talk to the device service and say, go act don't deactivate my device for me. The device service will now ask that question, can we deactivate the device? It will look at the device aggregate, which it gets from the device repository, and it will say, how many times has this person deactivated a device in the last year? In this case, it's only one, so we'll say, okay, we'll let you have this deactivation. So the can deactivate is true. At this point, the device service can use the license service to release all the licenses for that device. And then finally, it'll use the device repository, which will apply the device aggregate and the device command to the command handler and create a new event that says, this has happened. We've now deactivated that device. So all of these components, using the architecture that Robert just described, were extensible components easy to add, easy to extend the top level aggregate repository, command and event. As a result, putting in this entire flow, code completion, so creating all of those components from scratch, doing the unit testing, doing the smoke testing, the integration testing, the device testing, everything in order to get this out into production, took me under a week to do. Me, just one person. Never once did I have to touch the, the database. I didn't have to make direct changes to the database. All of this was done in the application Java layer. I didn't have to have any understanding of how the integration with Cassandra happened at all. So 
I think this is a pretty good example of the flexibility that we got out of this architecture. That anyone could come in that's new to our team and be able to have a pretty quick learning curve to get up to the ability to make these sort of changes. So what about debuggability? For me, I think this is actually the biggest win. So we have some really rudimentary tooling. We need to get a bit better at this, but all we have at the moment is we have an elastic search log of every single request that comes into our server. And we have an endpoint which gives us a event dump for a customer. It just gives us all of the events that the customers had in JSON format for us to look through. So even with this really rudimentary logging, we've been able to debug some pretty interesting edge case conditions. And I'm gonna go through one of the examples now. So what we noticed was we noticed that there was devices occasionally happening where they had licenses or they had downloads on the device which weren't being counted by our server. We weren't validating them properly. So we went and we got that dump of all the events and we stepped through. And what we saw was we had to start with an acquire license event. Good, that's what we want. This was followed by a few of the life cycle events that we have in our system. And then we saw a release event, perfect. That's just what we want. And a renew event, and wait. We've just renewed a released license. This license is meant to be closed. Why are we renewing it? What's going on here? So what was happening was we were ending up getting a license aggregate that was released, so we weren't counting it, but was continuing to be extended. So we were able to go through these events and say, okay, that renew license event happened at this point in time. We could correlate that to the device logs and we could see what was happening on the device and we could step through it. And we were able to help with the device team to actually identify a bug on the client which had an edge case condition that was reusing the license ID, the aggregate ID, and hence continuing to keep on acting on it. But it also identified a bug in our code. Can anyone see something like we're doing wrong here? We should never be renewing that license. This should be an invalid state transaction. When Robert mentioned before about the command handling, acting on invalid state, this is invalid state. We should never move a release license into a renewed state. That is an invalid state transaction and it should be caught by the command handler. So we were able to fix this bug on our system, on our side as well. All right, so what about the reliability? I mentioned before that we have fallbacks, so let's go back to that. When the client, when the device makes a call to us, it hits our Edge API layer and on the Edge API layer, we have a license accounting service client. It's a REST client that talks directly to our license accounting service. That service, in turn, talks to Cassandra. So we have two points of failure here. If either one of those fail, we could then disrupt client experience. So we need to make sure that this doesn't happen. If our failure occurs, you shouldn't be punished for that. So what we have is we have a default fallback response. This acts as if you'd never had any licenses, as if you would never had any downloads. Given that scenario, what would the response be? So we err on the side of customer experience. This gives us the ability to have an outage and you'll never even know. And we have had one very brief outage and no one knew the better. So this definitely has helped us with reliability. Lastly, I'm sure this is what you all wanted to hear. How did it scale? So the service itself scaled really well. From the very first day, we actually pinned high so that we could get an idea of what the traffic was gonna be. And then after we had a good um, log of what traffic was, we moved to our Scryer predictive scaling service. I'm not gonna deep dive, you can actually look, there's some tech blogs which talk about what Scryer is, but it basically looks at what customer traffic was and uses that to predict how much we should scale the service in the future. So the service scaled really well. What we had problems with was the Cassandra nodes. The Cassandra nodes which we used, <laughs> were very, very, very high throughput, low latency nodes, really great for serving traffic. However, they had a relatively low amount of storage. So what we saw pretty soon was this pretty graph which shows this lovely green line of disk storage rapidly reaching 100%. So while the blue line shows the requests and the throughput for the service and we could handle way more requests than what we currently got. 
the amount of nodes we had was not keeping up with the amount of data we had. All right, easy. Double the cluster. Done, right? <laughs> yeah, how scalable is that? That's not going to work. We need to find better solutions. We need to architect better solutions for our storage. So what are some options? We could look into TTLs. However, this was a few months of data, and we have to store this for the next year. Even then, there's edge case conditions that we have this life cycle, so you can't just drop events off. And we don't really want to. That's the point of event source. We want to keep this data. So there's another option. AWS offers a different storage optimized um, cluster called the D2 clusters. These have much more storage capacities. These have in the order of terabytes now. But the disadvantage is they have much higher latency, up to one second. One second. That's not really going to cut a real-time service like this. So why am I even mentioning this? What about a partitioned approach? What if we took that SSD I2 cluster, that really quick, low latency cluster, and we use that to serve the snapshot and subsequent events? So as Robert described, when we snapshot data, we take the, um, we take the current, uh, of course, I, aggregate, thank you. We take the current aggregate, and then we serialize that, and then we only replay any subsequent events onto that aggregate we're not really looking at the events that came before it. They're still there, we still use them for debugging purposes, but they're not used for the real-time request. So what if we took that snapshot and any subsequent events, and that's all we stored on those SSD nodes? Then, for the D2 drives, the ones with more disk space, for those, we can actually store all of the events. And we can use that for debugging purposes, which isn't real time, and a one second delay isn't going to be the end of the world. So what if we take this one step further? How many of you have heard of CQRS? OK. For those of you who haven't, I apologize. I'm not going to deep dive on it that much today. But just let me say it's where you segregate your command and query responsibility. This means that you can write, depending on the use case, to different storage mechanisms, and you can read, depending on the business use case, the business requirements, to different storage. So in this case, what we could have is we could have a write segregation where we have an event handler which determines when and where to write snapshots to, and then where to write events to, and how to write those events to which rows, dependent on the storage which it's going into. Then you could have a query segregator, and the query segregation could determine where it's going to read from. If this is a real-time event coming in for validation for a customer that needs a response right now, it can go straight to the I2 node and say, here's your response. If it's a debug request, it can go and get all of the events and get them and bring them back with a one-second latency, which is fine. Or we could even have both happening at the same time. We could go and do both, and then if we have any failure which happens to the I2 instance for any reason, we've still got this backup being processed, which we can then use from the D2 instance. So let's go now and recap what we've just looked at. Flexibility. This system, the event sourcing system, definitely gave us the flexibility that we wanted. We were able to very quickly iterate and create new changes to the domain model, react to business requirements immediately, and get the changes out into production. It's given us exactly what we wanted, and it's given us in the application layer. Never do we have to touch the database. Since we've, like, since we've released this, we have never directly had to touch the database. It's all been done in the application layer. Debugability. As I said, one of my favorite things, being able to pinpoint exactly when a state change happened that caused an invalid state, that happened ages ago and you only noticed it now, and then being able to go back and look at all the logs associated with that really helps pinpoint exactly where things might have gone wrong. Reliability, the fallbacks definitely helped us with that. Scalability, the service definitely scaled well. However, as I said, we do need to find good architectural solutions to make sure that we are utilizing the storage properly. So in conclusion, I want to bring up that, go back to the beginning of last year, none of us really had a good idea of what event sourcing was. We knew it as an abstract concept. We had no idea what the intricacies were or how to go about implementing it. Since then, we've implemented a solution that is flexible, debuggable, reliable, and scalable. And we've been using it on a daily basis successfully. 
And so I just want to say, this is something that you can do too. And we hope that you can come up with us, give us questions, give us, have a conversation with us, and let us know what you think. Thank you. All right, we have a few questions here. Hi, um, in your example, you showed um, can you speak a row loud? ID. In your example, you showed row ID as a customer ID, and you can aggregate by uh, for that customer how many active movies. Um, can you aggregate by um, properties of customer, like region he belongs to or yes. age group he belongs to? Yes. So the way it works is the aggregate repository um, ties to a single aggregate, and there's a function in the repository that says, "Give me the row ID." So the, the aggregate itself is responsible for defining the row ID. So like I said, simply we'll just use the name of the aggregate followed by the customer ID, but there's nothing to stop you from putting a value on there. So if you want to partition by not only an aggregate and its customer, but by a value, you're mo it's really simple to do. It's just a one line change of code. Hello, thanks for the presentation. I'm curious to know how do you guys deal with changes in the scheme of the event payloads over time? That's your name. <laughs> changes in the event schema? The version. Yeah, so we, as I said, we use the cryo versioning. So if we have a change, like, let me think of something recent. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head. Yeah, if we needed to add the request ID, so we had some deduping on request ID. So for us to actually change the schema to include the request ID so that we could actually act on that in the future, it's just a matter of adding the field to the aggregate as well as the event, which we have that ID happening on, and then we version that. And so we know any subsequent aggregates that have been using that version will actually set that request ID, and then we can check to see if it's there and act on it as needed. And the way we set the versioning is Cryo has annotations. So you could say there's an annotation at sense, yep. and you basically one up that number. So when you want to create a new version because you added a new field, you just put you annotate it with the at sense, whatever the largest number is, one up it and stamp it with that. So that's how Cryo stamps the version on the events when it serializes it. That yep. being said, I'll say versioning was by far one of the hardest things we ever had to do. Um, mm -hmm. It's just one of the things we couldn't wrap our head around. Uh, I think we uh, deleted a lot of scratch databases yeah. <laughs> before we felt comfortable moving with what we had. Uh, so be careful. Cryo's great and all, gives you what you need, but it's not going to solve all your problems. You still got to wrap your head around the system. And if you're interested, we do actually have an example. We had to remove it um, for time, but you can come and have a look and we'll show you how it's done. Um, my question is about aggregates and, um, and event sourcing. Um, how do you uh, enforce invariants because uh, the way you were uh, speaking, uh, aggregates are just pretty much just data. But is that is that it? And the conditions and states are uh, enforced somewhere else, or how does it work? Uh, so we do have the two enforcement layers. So we do have the service layer, which does actually validate. So the aggregate is the data essentially, but the data has been validated prior to being added. So before actually adding those events, we do validate to make sure that they can affect the data. If they're not allowed to affect the data, then they don't get added in the first place. But there's no actual condition once they're in the once they're in there, it's done. Like you're done, this is immutable. Whatever's happened has happened, and here's the current state based on that. You can change going forward, and you can change the validation going forward for those events. And you can say those events aren't allowed to have this field going forward, for example, but you can't change the past. And that's the nice thing about having the service layer. Um, the service layer right now says the download limit's only three. It's really easy for us to change that download service to like mm -hmm. five or 10. And we didn't change anything in the code. Now the service layer is aware and updated. And what was previously rejected to you is now going to pass into you know, the new upper limit. Yeah. Have you considered to keep the snapshot inside the device, like uh, inside the mobile device or inside the the device that is basically requesting the yeah. the movies to so be So we done. could. Um, that's up to the device teams. I don't think they were under their own pressure <laughs> to deliver this download service to everybody. So I don't think us coming to them and saying, you know, could you store all this data for us? They, that's part of something we would have been pushed back on. Yeah. So it it's was a up lot to of data as well. yeah, it's up to us to uh, store a lot of that state 
Okay, so let's make this the last question. Uh, hi. Hi. So I was curious about when you request um, the repository, am I authorized to get a new license? Do you uh, give back some sort of token saying that this guy is retrieving a new license or do you just say yes or not? The aggregate ID is the token actually. Yeah. So I use generic examples where it just said house of cards. It's actually a UUID and we call that the license ID. So the license ID and the aggregate ID are the same thing. So we'll hand the license to the device Devices takes note of the license ID and it stores it with the license. So let's say um, the device wants to delete the license and wants to let us know that the license has been deleted. It's going to send us the delete event, but it's also going to send us the license ID. Take the license ID and we'll use that as the aggregate ID to get it out of the data and store. And that license ID is actually a token as well. So it does store information about the transaction, which we can use. All right. Well, thank you very much, okay. everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you.